All right, good morning. It is Monday, May 10th, 2021. We are at our last lecture where we finally get to finish off the last little bit of information. You are going to be responsible not just for 431, but for all of anatomy and physiology. So we are almost there. And that is basically development. And again, as we talked about um, last time, I mean, they're literally classes uh, where you spend the whole semester talking about this stuff. So we, this is going to be the most cursory overview of some of just the key highlights and points of this process um, to just finish us off for this uh, class, just so we have some exposure to it. But obviously, for those of you that are interested in this, there are semester long classes where you can take for that. Uh, the lecture shouldn't take all of the class time today, so there should be time for a uh, review. Uh, both for the lab and lecture exam coming up, but also for the final exam. So ask, answer any last questions. Because, knock on wood, if everything goes well, this could potentially be the last time I see you. Uh, so, because after this, it's just exams. Uh, Wednesday, uh, in two days, you have your last lab and lecture exam. So hopefully, hopefully you took good uh, use of this weekend to study well for that. Uh, you've already taken four of those. Some of you have already taken nine of those. So you know what to expect from that. So that's no surprises. Uh, then on Monday, one week from today is finals week. So we do not have class on that day. I will be here for the first couple hours to answer any questions. And of course, obviously you don't have to wait till Monday the 17th to ask me questions. I'm always good at responding to emails. I have my normal office hours. If those don't work for you time-wise, then email me and uh, we can either correspond via email or I can meet you at some other time. But formally, I'll be here during that time to just answer any questions if you guys need it. I'm most likely drunk, but I will be here. And then finally, on Wednesday the 19th, you have your cumulative final exam. 100 multiple choice questions covering everything we've talked about. And you'll have about 100 minutes to complete that in. So uh, that will be done again in the class time as normal. But again, obviously, it's not going to take you four hours to complete that. So get it done early, be done, and celebrate. All right. Questions on any of that? All right, away we go. And I have one quick question. Yeah, certainly. How long did you say we had for the final to take it? Uh, it will be, uh, it, well, it, it, 100 questions, 100 multiple choice questions. You'll have about 100 minutes for it, uh, but it'll be probably closer to almost two hours. I haven't quite figured out the timing of it yet. Obviously, I want to give you time to be able to do your scan and do all that kind of junk because I know that counts across against the clock. Uh, but uh, just like in the classroom, you have about two hours to complete the exam, and that's about what you'll have. Uh, so somewhere between 100 and 120 minutes will be what it ends up at. All right. All right. So as I mentioned, our primary focus is going to be on what we talked about right here. We've led up everything to fertilization. Uh, so we will talk more about fertilization and then the process by which that uh, fertilized egg implants itself into the uterine wall and develops into a baby. Again, as we've talked about, we've spent a fair amount of time discussing how we make those uh, haploid gametes, the spermatozoa and the ova, and we've talked about all the things that involve in that. And again, the goal of that process in part is to make uh, two haploid cells with two haploid nuclei that when the egg is fertilized uh, by the sperm is able to become a single diploid cell, which as we talked about becomes the uh, zygote. Right. Again, from the uh, vaginal canal to the ampulla of the uterine tube, right? Because that's basically the journey that the sperm has to take. It has to go from the vaginal canal uh, where it is presented to the ampulla of the uterine tube is a relatively short distance, right? That it has to travel. It doesn't have to go that far. It's only about five inches uh, and it can occur relatively quickly. Uh, sperm can travel that distance in as little as three minutes. Uh, for other sperm, it may take as long as several hours for it to reach that stage. So again, there's some variations in the speed of those sperm. Uh, but as we also talked about, it is an incredibly treacherous journey. As we talked about, somewhere on the order of 200 million sperm enter the vagina uh, with the ejaculate. 
However, of those that enter in the vaginal canal, only about 2 million actually reach the head of the cervix. Remember, as we talked about, that head of the cervix has a mucus plug protecting it and limiting opening uh, to that cervical canal as well. Now, as we mentioned during ovulation, uh, that mucus plug does thin to help to allow sperm to get in. But of those 2 million that actually reach the cervix, only about 10,000 reach the uterine tube. Of course, there are two uterine tubes, and do both of them contain uh, ova or secondary oocytes ready to be fertilized? No. Uh, luckily, that secondary oocyte does release a chemical signal, which is an attractant, making it more likely uh, that the sperm will go to the uterine tube where the oocyte is located, but it isn't guaranteed. And so of those 10,000 that reach the uterine tube, only about 200 reach the secondary oocyte. So remember, we talked about a male that produces basically, you know, 100 million sperm per milliliter of ejaculate is essentially infertile and capable of fertilizing a female on her own. And because of this mass attrition, of these, because remember also, unlike in the movies, unlike in the cartoons, it's not the first sperm that gets there that wins, right? As we talked about, uh, that egg has a lot of protections on the outer uh, surface. And so it takes hundreds of sperms to break down uh, that, uh, pr those protections so that one is finally able to uh, work its way through and fertilize that egg. And so if we can't get the, the spermatozoa there in, in large enough numbers, they're not going to be able to penetrate the defenses and fertilization will not be able to take place. Exactly. There you go. Although you should think it'd be the other way around. Yes. Part of the reason why there's such massive attrition is because the spermatozoa won't stop to ask for directions, but you would think that the ones that actually make it there would have the better navigational skills. And so we would all have better navigational skills. And yet here we are. I love this illustration. I believe it's from your textbook, but it's been such a long time I don't remember now. But uh, I do like about this is that it really shows and gives us an appreciation of the difference of the size uh, between the spermatozoa and the secondary oocyte. Right? Remember, as we talked about, uh, that secondary oocyte has to have everything uh, necessary. It's got to have the Golgi apparatus, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the mitochondria, everything that is going to be necessary for this to divide the trillions of times to become a little baby. Whereas that sperm, as we've talked about also, is basically just a chromosomal missile. So the job is to get that, the half of the genetic material there, and that's really all that the male provides to the process. All right, let's talk about what has to occur before fertilization takes place. Obviously, step one is ovulation. That secondary oocyte is released from the ovary during ovulation and successfully enters into the uterine tube. Again, remember those fimbria are producing that wave-like currents in the uh, serous fluid of the peritoneal cavity helping to draw that secondary oocyte up into the uterine tube, at which point the cilia of those simple columnar epithelial cells help to drive that secondary oocyte about a third of the length of the uterine tube to the ampulla. Wait, can you As say the last thing again? I'm sorry? Can you, can you repeat that last phrase you said again, somehow just went in one ear and out the other? That's all right. I wasn't paying any attention either. Uh, I, uh, uh, basically, what I said is that the secondary oocyte is ovulated from the ovary. Uh, the fimbria produce wave-like motions in the serous fluid of the peritoneal cavity with the goals of helping to draw it into the uterine tube. And then once into the uterine tube, cilia uh, of those simple columnar epithelial cells and some peristaltic contractions if uh, the female is aroused or has orgasmed uh, can help to draw that egg down towards the ampulla, about a third of the way down there. As we mentioned also, the secondary oocyte is releasing a chemical attractant to help to encourage the sperm to go to the correct uterine tube uh, so that it can find the egg. And so there it's sitting there waiting. Uh, 
At the same time, obviously, copulation must take place. Ejaculation takes place into the vaginal canal, and the sperm swim uh, using their uh, flagella uh, to propel themselves forward. Remember also, as we mentioned, if the female orgasms, uh, it can produce a reverse peristalsis of the uterus and the vaginal canal, which can help to draw the sperm up towards uh, that uterine tube. Uh, remember also, uh, we talked about the prostaglandins that are released from the, uh, as part of the components of the ejaculate from the seminal vesicle, can also uh, produce contractions of the uterine tube to help to encourage, a part of the uterus, to help to encourage the sperm uh, up towards the egg. And remember also, as we mentioned, it's not just a race to get to the egg, but remember we also talked about that process of capacitation has to take place, right? Our uh, acrosomial cap that contains the enzymes has to uh, be, uh, come fragile and be ready to break and release those enzymes. It has to be ready to make the powerful swimming contractions necessary to break through the defenses, and that can take a bit of time as well. So again, all of these events have to occur just to get those two kooky kids together and hopefully get the start of the fertilization process going. All right. Here we see an example of, uh, I noticed fertilization has actually taken place in this, but what's nice about this particular illustration is it reminds us of those protective defenses that we were referring to. Here is our secondary oocyte. And again, we wanna be careful because we can see here fertilization has taken place, which has allowed uh, our secondary oocyte to start anaphase. It is in the process of dividing. We know it is already divided once, so we have that first polar body already in there. Uh, but before the uh, egg is fertilized, remember it is frozen in metaphase two. So it hasn't separated these yet, but it is ready to, but we do still have our first polar body. But what I like about this picture is again, it does a good job of showing us our protective coating. As we've not talked about before, we have our remaining granulosa cells that were in direct contact with the egg itself, that corona radiata, and that glycogen-rich uh, candy-coated shell, that zona pellucida. So these are the two layers of protection uh, that our egg, uh, pardon me, that our sperm is going to have to penetrate through to get to that egg. Our zona pellucida has a very important structure on its outer surface. This illustration doesn't show it, but I'll cheat and go ahead and draw one on here. It has these very important uh, binding sites that are known as the ZP3 receptors. These receptors are actually what the head of the sperm is going to come in contact with, not so that the head of the sperm can penetrate into the egg, but this is going to activate the sperm, basically cause the breaking of that acrosomial cap, which will release the digestive enzymes. And then it also causes the sperm to produce a very vigorous tail whipping structure so that basically it mashes its head into the zona pellucida, digging those digestive enzymes in so that it can start to penetrate that barrier and find its way to the plasma membrane of the secondary oocyte. That process of stimulating the release of that enzyme and that whipping of the tail is what we call the acrosomial reaction. So again, the sperm binds to the ZP3 receptor our acrosomial cap, which has become fragile during capacitation, now ruptures, releasing those digestive enzymes. And the, the sperm will vigorously start whipping its, its tail to try to burrow through that, um, that glycogen-rich zona pellucidum. This process uh, typically exhausts the sperm 
So if it is not able to penetrate through the zone of pellucida, basically it runs out of energy, it runs out of fuel, it runs out of resources, and basically degenerates and goes away. But it's put a pit into the defenses that then the next one can come and expand upon. And so as we talked about, it isn't just the first sperm that gets there that wins. Hundreds of these sperm have to work together to penetrate the defenses until finally one is going to be able to successfully find its way inside. All right, questions on that? Excellent. Now, even fertilization, right? It isn't the first sperm that gets there. It also isn't even the sperm that actually penetrates the egg. What happens here, and let's cheat a little bit, do some quick drawing. Here is the plasma membrane of our uh, oocyte. Here is that thick zone of pellucida on the outer surface. And as we talked about, as our sperm are able to dig the hole and penetrate their way in, oops, I wanted that. When a spermatozoa is finally able to get in, it doesn't actually penetrate the plasma membrane of the secondary oocyte. There are actually receptors on its surface. Again, not the ZP3 receptors, those are on the uh, zona pellucida, but there are these receptors that the uh, are on the surface of the plasma membrane of the secondary oocyte. And when the sperm comes in contact with it, that actually causes the plasma membrane to endocytose, basically just the head of the sperm. So it isn't even the sperm that fertilizes the egg, it's the egg that actually endocytoses the head of the sperm, drawing it inside. Now, how many sperm do we want to actually get inside? One. Yeah, just one, absolutely, right? Because otherwise uh, we would have too many chromosomes. That is our goal. Our goal is to just have one sperm fertilize the one egg, and that process is what we call syngamy. If more than one sperm, were to be able to get into and fertilize the egg, then we would call that polyspermy and we would have the wrong number of chromosomes and that would not produce a viable zygote and would not become a viable baby as a result. Luckily, there are two main um, processes that help to discourage polyspermy from occurring. The first is what we call the fast block. This is called the fast block. Uh, because as you can see by the name, as it indicates, it occurs basically one to three seconds after the uh, head of the sperm comes in contact with the plasma membrane of the egg. When that occurs, it causes a rapid depolarization of our secondary oocyte. This depolarization causes the opening of voltage-gated calcium channels on the endoplasmic reticulum to open. And there is a massive release of calcium into the, uh, sec into the secondary oocyte. Now, this depolarization discourages the binding of more sperm to the plasma membrane. So again, if fewer, if no more sperm bind to the plasma membrane, then that is going to help us to uh, ensure that one and only one gets in. But 
as we also know, calcium makes cells do wonky things. And the wonky thing in this case is what we call the slow block or the cortical reaction. And basically three things occur with this cortical reaction. The first thing that occurs is an exocytosis of a special protein called the zonal inhibiting protein. As we know, on that zona pellucida, as we talked about on the outer surface, there are those ZP3 receptors. As we said, the head of the sperm binds to them and that bursts their enzymatic cap, that, that uh, acrosomial cap, and it triggers that vigorous uh, 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 swimming action to try to help to penetrate the defenses. Well, what zonal inhibiting proteins does is it inhibits this or inactivates these binding sites. So no more sperm are gonna be activated, no more sperm are gonna release their digestive enzymes, no more sperm are gonna start vigorously beating their tails to try to penetrate the defenses. The other thing that it is going to do is it is actually gonna cause a thickening and a strengthening of the zona pellucidum. Because while that egg has now been fertilized, it's not gonna hatch out of its shell just yet. It's gonna stay in there for several days. So since the sperm have been beating the heck out of that shell, trying to destroy it, we need to build it back up and provide a little bit more protection. So that's the first thing that this cortical reaction is going to do. The second thing oops, that the, it is going to do is it is going to trigger the completion of meiosis II. giving us, of course, as a result of that, our second polar body and our now mature ovum. And the third thing it is going to do is it is going to lead to the endocytosis of the uh, sperm's head. Bringing in that um, haploid nucleus. I think your book's got a pretty picture that shows this process. Here we go. So notice again, the sperm making contact with that ZP3 receptor, breaking the acrosomial clap, uh, cap, causing that vigorous swimming action to start to penetrate the defenses. Once one finally gets through that zona pellucida, it is able to bind to the receptors on the surface of our a plasma membrane for our secondary oocyte. That is gonna trigger a massive depolarization. That depolarization is gonna make it harder for any other sperm's head to bind to it. It is going to trigger the massive release of calcium that is going to lead to that cortical reaction where we release that, um, that inhibiting protein, zonal inhibiting protein, which is going to inhibit uh, or inactivate the binding sites, strengthen the zonal pellucidum, draw the head of the sperm in so that sperm's nucleus gets brought in. Notice the tail and the motor region are left behind and triggers the division, the completion of meiosis II. All righty. Are so there that, a lot of the Z3 receptors or is it like just a few? No, there are massive numbers of ZP3 receptors, absolutely. All right, because again, we only about 200 sperm get there and we want to make sure as many of them as we can get it activated so that we can get them through these defenses to be able to fertilize that egg. But really make contact with the egg so that the egg can then draw the head in. All right, again, fertilizing the egg makes it sound like it's an active process of the sperm. It's really not. The active process of the sperm is to come in contact with the plasma membrane. Then the egg actively draws the nucleus inside. 
All right. Questions on that? All right. That, so again, this is the real process. Shockingly, right? The most uh, probably viewed version of this, right? Look who's talking, right? It was absolutely incorrect in the way that it, it described this process. All right. I don't know if you get that reference either. I don't care. Excellent. So here's the end result. We end up here with that ovum that has the head of the sperm or really the nuclear region of the sperm, that nucleus come in, what we call those pronuclei uh, that enter in there. And both are wrapped in their own plasma membranes. So we have basically what we call these two. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, I know exactly. That's what I picture as well. Um, those two pronuclei. Now, essentially what happens is this cell, uh, again, the last thing that happens with that massive release of calcium is an increase in metabolism. And with that increase in metabolism, the cell basically starts um, mitosis. With this, what's going to happen is we have to start to get a breakdown of the, oops, let's change the different color, of the nuclear envelopes from these. And as we get this breakdown of the nuclear envelopes from these, then finally our chromosomes are able to come together. And when our chromosomes come together, we end up finally with a diploid cell. And when we finally have that diploid cell, we have a single cell with 46 chromosomes, unique from the cells of mom's body that we call a zygote. And now that zygote can start the division process. Here's a great pretty picture showing this. Again, notice as uh, the sperm makes contact with the plasma membrane of the egg, we get uh, the triggering of that acrosomial reaction, thickening of the zona pellucida, right? Uh, a release of the zona inhibiting protein. But what we care about right now is that completion of meiosis two. We have our secondary oocyte dividing to form our ovum and our second polar body. Notice our first polar body is also undergoing division. So we end up with the four cells that we expect from the completion of meiosis one and meiosis two, but uneven division. Three polar bodies that just contain genetic material and pretty much nothing else. But notice they're still trapped inside of the zona pellucida. And as I said, basically these nucleic acids are going to be broken down and used as resources for the rapid division that is going to need to take place. Those two pronuclei start to come together. Uh, they replicate their DNA. Our second centrosome forms. We start to get the breaking down of the nuclear envelopes, right? Basically, we enter prophase. Oh, we actually have to interphase and prophase because interphase is necessary for uh, the division of, I mean, for the replication of our genetic material. And then we start prophase. And at that point, as the nuclear envelopes break down, we now consider this to be a single cell with 46 chromosomes. And at this stage in prophase of mitosis, we now have our zygote. All right, questions on that? So it completes meiosis two and then does mitosis again? Yeah, because again, if this, well, it, it starts, it goes into interphase because now that it has these two no nuclei, again, remember, we have uh, the uh, 
pronucleus from the male, which is at N, has 23 unreplicated chromosomes. And the after the uh, after meiosis two, our ovum has 23 unreplicated chromosomes as well. But if this zygote is going to divide from one cell to two cells, and we want both of those cells to have 46, then uh, during this growth process, we need to first enter a quick interface so that in this quick interface, uh, we can get, and it is, let's say it this way, it is a quick interface. I'll make a point of emphasizing this because its primarily goal is the S phase. In S phase, we are going to replicate the genetic material. So this one is 2N, uh, pardon me, this one is uh, not 2N, oops. This one is NR, this one is NR. So when they come together as a zygote, they are 2NR, 46 chromosomes that are replicated, ready for mitosis to take place. Now, I mentioned a quick interface because normally, if we think about interphase, the longest section of interphase is G1. G1 is when it's replicating all of the uh, cytoplasm, making all of the organelles, making more mitochondria, and the cell grows massively bigger. If you think back way, way back to uh, 430, when we were looking at that onion root tip, uh, one of the ways we could tell cells that were in uh, you know, interphase uh, getting ready to divide and those that had just finished dividing in telophase was the size. The ones that were big and massive were ready to divide. The ones where were small had just finished dividing. So part of that process is getting bigger so that when the cell divides, there's plenty of cytoplasm to share with both of them. However, this one's stuck inside the candy-coated shell. Is there gonna be a lot of room for it to grow and expand inside of that? No. So in this case, it isn't so much about caring about the cell getting bigger, it's about making sure we have enough genetic material. So by replicating the DNA in S phase, then one cell can divide to become two cells. Then we replicate the genetic material again, so two cells can become four cells, and then four cells become eight cells, and so on and so forth. And notice, we went from one cell to eight cells, but the overall size of the structure is the same. So we went from one large cell to eight smaller cells. So with this quick interface, really all we're worrying about is getting the DNA replicated so that when the cell divides, both cells are viable. Both cells have all of the genetic material that we need, but the cells aren't getting any bigger. Instead, as they divide, the cells get smaller and smaller and smaller. But the overall size stays the same. All right, does that make sense? Excellent. And that's exactly what happens. Now we did, I think we talked about this in the last class, but I'll remind us again. Uh, in this process we just talked about, it was one sperm and one egg. And we get one baby. But there are times when we get two babies and we call those twins. But there are differences between monozygotic and dizygotic, or what are also known as fraternal twins. And what's the difference here? Genetic um, similarity. Why? You're absolutely 100% correct. But why is, there, is, why is that different? How many eggs? How many sperm? Excellent. With a monozygotic twins, how many eggs and sperm? One egg, one sperm, they split. Exactly, typically, as we talked about, this is going to uh, divide to become two cells and two become four and four become eight and eight become 16 and so on and so forth until they become one person. But what happens with monozygotic twins is while it's a bundle of cells, those cells actually separate to form two bundles of cells. And then those two bundles of cells divide to become two uh, genetically identical individuals. Now, usually that occurs early enough in the process where they complete individuals. However, if that division 
occurs later, then they can still actually be partially connected and actually can share organs or attachments. And what do we call that when that occurs? Conjoined twins. Yeah, we call that conjoined twins, absolutely. So if that, if that division doesn't occur completely or that division occurs later in the process, uh, they can actually still be conjoined, right? As you guys mentioned with dizygotic, this is an instance where the female releases two eggs. Uh, dizygotic twins tend to run in families, uh, not surprisingly from the maternal side, because what happens is the females are more likely to release two eggs during an ovulation. And so when that occurs, each egg is fertilized in individually. So basically what you have are two offspring that are as genetically similar as two offspring that were born at different times, right? So if you have a baby and three years later, you have another baby. That's exactly the same thing as having dizygotic twins, except that you're having both of them at the same time. And as we've talked about, there have even been instances where you have dizygotic twins that are actually half siblings, same mom, different dads. One egg gets fertilized by one dad, one gets fertilized by the sperm of a second. All right, makes Mother's Day a little bit more awkward, but hey, there you go. All right, questions on that? Oh, which reminds me, hopefully all of you who either are moms or have moms, I hope that you guys had a, a great Mother's Day. All right, questions on this? All right. Time for some more vocabulary. This rapid division without the change in size is what we call the process of cleavage, right? Excellent, well, hopefully you were pampered uh, by your loved ones so that they took care of all your wants and needs so you could just sit and focus and study enjoying the beautiful weather we had, hopefully outside in the shade. And enjoyed that, absolutely. So our zygote divides to form two cells that we call blastomeres. So once that zygote divides, one zygote becomes two blastomeres. And that first cleavage occurs usually within the first 30 hours. Now, again, notice we have the two cells and then don't forget, we still have those polar bodies. That's what you're seeing here. Those are nothing else but just genetic uh, fuel for the division process. So this is just two blastomeres. The second division, which gives us four cells, typically occurs uh, by the second day. By day three, we get a bundle of solid bundle of cells of about 16 cells called a marula. And then by day four, we have a solid ball of about 100 cells. And these are undifferentiated cells. What I mean by that is if I were to take this cell and this cell and pluck them off and switch their positions and put them back together, would this individual have toes where their fingers are and fingers where their toes are if I did that? No. Right, so as we, if we, these cells are completely undifferentiated at this point. It's just a solid ball, massive cells, and it doesn't matter how I were to twist and turn them. Basically, they all have the potential to become anything that they want to be, and there isn't any differentiation to them. I make a point of emphasizing this because as we go from day four to day five, it looks the same on the outer surface but we are finally getting some major changes that are going on on the inside. And it is at about this stage, about day four or five, 
And remember also we could said it can take as long as seven days for that rapidly dividing fertilized bundle of cells, basically this embryo, to make its way to the uterus. Remember this whole time it is being propelled by peristalsis. and by uh, those cilia. It is being propelled in about day four or five, but as late as day seven, it reaches the uterus. Now, by day five, and again here at day five, as I, know, as I mentioned from the outside, it still looks still looks like a solid ball of cells. But notice if we cut it in half, now we actually see that some differentiation has occurred. And at this point where this differentiation has occurred, we now consider this big ball of cells what we call a blastocyst. So blastomeres start to differentiate and become a blastocyst. This blastocyst has made it to the uterus. Remember, as we talked about, because of the high levels of progestin, uh, we are having that massive glandularization of the functional layer of the endometrium, producing massive amounts of that uterine milk that is going to be sustaining this blastocyst while it reaches there. And it stays in this stage for several days before implantation takes place. So that uterine milk is vitally important uh, for the uh, maintenance of this blastocyst as it is just hanging out in the uterus. At this point, it has differentiated into three distinct regions. I'll draw over this of the highlighter. Uh, we have the biggest cluster of cells on the inside, this condensing of cells on the inside known as the inner cell mass. From the outer surface, it looks like a solid ball of cells because we have this solid outer layer of cells that is known as the trophoblast. And then on the inside, we have this big fluid filled space. And this big fluid filled space is known as the blastocyst cavity. So here, finally with our blastocyst stage, they're not just cell cells anymore, they're starting to differentiate, they're starting to become different components. Trophoblast is what is going to become the placenta. The inner cell mass becomes the baby. And then that fluid filled space. And again, we've gone from one cell to hundreds of cells, but it's all still the original size that it was before. It is all still happening within the zone of pellucidum. So the overall size of the cell really hasn't gotten any bigger. Did you say the trophoblast becomes the placenta? Yes. And the fluid filled space becomes baby? No, the inner cell mass. The inner, inner cell, cell mass. mass. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right. Now, while this is all happening in the zone of pellucida, eventually it is going to need to hatch. And once it hatches, then implantation can take place. Now, before we go through the process of implantation, let me do this.
Again, I found this one quickly myself. I'm sure you can find better examples of this, uh, but when you go to the almighty um, YouTube, my, oops, come on, there we go. Here we go, we can see a time-last image of that cleavage process occurring. So there is our zygote inside of the zona pellucida. And that one zygote becomes two blastomeres. Two become four, four become eight. And again, we see this continued division as the cells get smaller and smaller and the overall size stays the same because this is all still occurring inside of that um, zona pellucidum. This point, now it's a morella, a solid ball of uh, uh, blastomeres. But as it continues to divide, becoming more and more and more, we start to see this differentiation that's gonna take place. There we go. We see that formation of, whoops, let's go back just a teeny bit. So we can see the inner cell mass that is formed. We can see the uh, trophoblast that is formed on the outer center. And then there is that uh, blastocyst cavity that is occurring here. And if you noticed, I just went back from it. We actually see the hatching of this uh, blastocyst out of that zona pellucida finally. So as we watch, it bursts through that zona pellucida. Oh, and then there you go. We get apparently didn't get to see the end of it. Um, and then once it uh, once it bursts out of that uh, breaks out of that zona pellucida, it is then going to be ready for implantation to take place. So again, like I said, I'm sure there are plenty of examples of this. I just wanted to show you one quick one that I was able to find, uh, but I'm sure there are plenty others that are really nice that you can see as well of that process. All right, all right, excellent questions on that. So we have uh, so far talked about all of these events from fertilization, how we maintain syngamy with that slow and that fast uh, um, uh, block, and then uh, the division that takes place as it travels down the uterine tube till we have that blastocyst in the uh, belly, in the uh, lumen, of the uterus. So we've made it to here. All right. And now the last thing we have to do is rupture, break out of that zona pellucida. And then once that occurs, our blastocyst can implant in the uterine wall. And that's what we have to talk about. Yes. About uh, next. And yes, IVF is truly an amazing process. Absolutely. All right. That's what they do. They take the egg and the sperm, put it together, get it to the point of a blastocyst. And then as a blastocyst, they implant it within, or they, you know, turkey based it into the uterus and hope that, you know, one, two, 17 of them attach to the uterine wall and, right. And then you get your own reality TV show. All right, questions on that. All right, then let's briefly talk about the process of implantation. Like I said, after a day or two inside of the lumen of the uterus, our blastocyst hatch and remains floating around inside the uh, uterus. And like I said, got there about day five, takes about two days for it to implant. So usually about seven to 10 days after fertilization takes place. Although again, Remember, we're dealing with this tricky common core math. So we are talking seven to 10 days after fertilization. But remember, after fertilization takes place, because we count the age of the baby from first men, I mean, from the last menses, technically it is already, right, 21 to um, 
24 days old. And we'll put that in quotes. Because again, we're dealing with that common core type math here because we count the age from last mensis, the beginning of the last mensis. But regardless of how old we want to call this blastocyst, the goal of it is to Im implant into the functional layer of the endometrium. Now to do this, the first thing that has to occur is our blastocyst has to rotate. Notice as it rotates, our inner cell mass faces uh, the wall of the endometrium. So it has to turn and rotate so that it can bind to the functional layer. Typically, we, uh, if this occurs and we want this to occur either within the body or up here within the fundus. Why are those the regions that we want implantation to take place? Otherwise the placenta might be over the cervical opening. Exactly. If it, if, it, if it implants too close to the cervix, then as the placenta forms, that placenta can actually partially or completely cover the cervical opening. Obviously, are you going to be able to have a normal vaginal birth if the placenta is over the top of the cervix? No, right, because it's in the way of the baby getting out. But even more than that, the other risk that occurs is at late stage during pregnancy as that uh, cervical canal dilates, that dilation of the cervix can actually cause a tearing or a rupturing of the placenta, which can lead to massive bleeding. So when that occurs, and it is luckily something that can be identified uh, with the uh, ultrasound, uh, if that is indeed the case, then typically what happens is the, the female is uh, 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 not induced, but is uh, scheduled for cesarean, typically relatively early and definitely in the late stage is either bedridden or uh, is closely, closely monitored uh, during the late stages of pregnancy. And then as soon as the baby is, is able to, then it is removed uh, with a cesarean section to protect both mom and the baby. All right, excellent. So as that, and we see our uh, blastocyst has attached to the wall of the functional layer, we get this massive transformation that takes place in our trophoblast. Now, yes, there's a massive transformation taking place with the inner cell mass as well. We'll talk about that very, very briefly. But what I wanna focus on right now is actually the trophoblast. I'm sorry? Okay, um, a portion of the trophoblast basically stays that shell, that outer layer of this developing structure. And that portion that stays the shell helps to form the boundaries of this is what we call the cytotrophoblast. But the second component of this trophoblast uh, forms these dramatic uh, extensions, these dramatic finger long uh, extensions of cells that produce a massive amount of digestive enzymes. And this region is called the syncytiotrophoblast, which as I mentioned, I guarantee you is a term you're gonna have to spell at one point or another on the exam. This syncytiotrophoblast producing those digestive enzymes is actually what eats away at the functional layer to actually burrow this uh, blastocyst down into the wall so that it is actually completely covered and surrounded within the wall, the functional layer of the endometrium. So again, the syncytiotrophoblast produce these secre uh, secretes these digestive enzymes breaking down the wall of the endometrium, burrowing it inside, whereas the cytotrophoblast is going to form and maintain that original shape uh, to allow for the development of the embryo inside. Here, we see that process, these long extensions of the syncytiotrophoblast as it is penetrating down in, digesting away the layers of the endometrium. 
until at about day 12, it is completely embedded uh, within the functional layer. And I have a great picture that'll show this in just a minute. Now, again, remember, as we talked about, our developing cells have been producing that human chorionic gonadotropin and our uh, trophoblast continues to produce this because again, we need to maintain that uterine wall. Remember specifically what our human chorionic gonadotropin does is it maintains the corpus luteum, All right? Remember luteinizing hormone levels have dropped. And that luteinizing hormone is what normally maintains the corpus luteum. Actually, I guess I'll put that there. But human chorionic gonadotropin is also capable of maintaining that corpus luteum. So even though luteinizing hormone levels have dropped, our corpus luteum stays thick and large, well uh, glandularized. So it still produces massive amounts of progestins, massive amounts of estrogens to maintain the uterine wall. And the trophoblast will continue to do that, especially if you think about it, since we mentioned the trophoblast eventually helps to form our placenta, which of course will then not only produce human chorionic gonadotropin, but will also actually start to produce the estrogens and the, and the progestins and many other hormones as well. Now, I did mention that the trophoblast becomes the placenta, but in fairness, it only becomes part of the placenta. Here we see that process of implantation. Again, that syncytiotrophoblast is releasing that digestive enzymes that is breaking down the wall of the endometrium. Our cytotrophoblast is still maintaining the shape and the structure of the blastocyst as it is penetrating inside. Notice there's massive changes going on with our inner cell mass, which we'll talk about uh, in just a minute. Here we see the massive changes that are taking place in there. But what I want to actually talk about instead is what's going on out here with the syncytiotrophoblast. Yes, the syncytiotrophoblast is uh, massively digesting the walls of the endometrium. But as we know, those walls not only are heavily glandularized, but they are also heavily vascularized as well. So as we start breaking down the walls of the endometrium, we start producing these spaces inside the uterine wall that become these big, huge, massive, uh, basically what we call intervillous spaces that fill with the maternal blood. Notice our syncytiotrophoblast, not only is it producing these digestive enzymes, but it starts to produce these elongated uh, villi that stick out into these intervillous spaces. And these villi are actually gonna become filled with capillaries. And so as these villi fill with capillaries, as these spaces fill with maternal blood, this is going to be where the exchange of materials takes place. This is where the baby gets the oxygen, and the nutrients. This is where the baby is able to get rid of the carbon dioxide and some waste materials. This is where chemical signals from mom can help to uh, motivate development of the baby. This is where the antibodies uh, to uh, the RH antigen uh, can cross to cause problems for the baby to occur. Notice here, this is the structure that is going to become the placenta. And notice in the placenta, mom's blood supply and baby's blood supply do not mix. All right, we don't want them to mix because, again, they could be different blood types. Uh, they could have different uh, antigens on their surface, and that can cause a major reaction that we wouldn't want. So they're in close proximity to each other. They have a large surface area. 
but they don't actually come in contact. And again, baby's blood is constantly circulating and circulating in these capillaries. But as we mentioned, we have these big intervillous spaces where new blood is constantly coming into it and old blood is constantly coming out. Why wouldn't we just want capillaries here for the exchange between mom and baby? This is growing really fast. And if you have too much blood supply, it could cause a hemorrhage. True, absolutely. That is massive growth and, and blood supply could be hard to control during this massive growth. That could be an issue as well. That's a great point. Absolutely. The other issue that we have is that um, the conditions of mom's blood is dynamic, right? Depending on if mom's exercising, blood temperature could go up and down. pH could go up and down, uh, right? Despite what we think about pregnant females, they're actually not constantly eating. So the nutrients, the glucose levels, all of those things in the blood are dynamically changing. Whereas if we have this reservoir, yes, fresh blood is coming into it, older blood is leaving it, but with this reservoir, it allows for a little bit more stable blood condition, slightly more stable nutrients, slightly more stable hormones, uh, so on and so forth uh, of this reservoir so that the blood being uh, exposed to these villi feeding the baby can maintain a more constant uh, condition to keep more stable growth going. So that's one of the huge advantages of not just having capillary against capillary, but by having this reservoir of the females of the mom's blood, we're able to provide a more stable environment for that exchange of resources. Yes, new blood's gotta come in. Yes, old blood's gotta go. Uh, but it provides a big, huge reservoir, so stable conditions for consistent growth. So the syncytiotrophoblast eventually becomes what is the placenta blood barrier? Placental the the blood barrier. baby's portion of it, yes. It becomes the villi and the capillaries that are, go as you can see, that would become what are actually known as the chorionic villi uh, that are going to attain the capillaries. And I actually think I have a picture of that. Um, We'll get to the, I think we get to the placenta. Yeah, see, here we go. We'll still get to that in a second. So yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll look at a mature placenta and see what this becomes. But yes, this insidiotrophoblast doesn't just penetrate in, but it digests the, the walls of the endometrium to form these cavities, these intervillous spaces to form these reservoirs. But it also forms these, extens these extensions, these villi that are gonna fill with capillaries to allow the exchange to take place. So yes, they form the baby's portion of the placenta. Before we take a look at that mature placenta, again, I do want to talk a teeny bit about what's happening with that inner cell mass. Again, this is a complete disservice to the entire process because it's a massive, massive, elaborate process. But like I said, we could literally spend the whole semester talking about this stuff. So just uh, the one point that I want to make is one of the things starting way back in 430 we talked about are some of the different types of embryonic cells, those embryonic stem cells uh, that cause the development of different types of tissues. So for instance, we talked about how the endoderm uh, that forms, there's basically three embryonic layers that form in that inner cell mass. Uh, one is the endoderm that basically becomes the epithelium of the gastrointestinal tract and the respiratory tract. We have our mesoderm, uh, which produces the muscle cells, bone cells, and all of the other connective tissues. Right? Those are the ones that become the mesenchymal cells that we talked about that produce all the cells associated with connective tissues. And we have the ectoderm, uh, which is what produces that nervous tissue. Again, we talked about in 430 briefly how that nervous tissue starts as a plate and then forms a crest, rolls up into a tube, forms those ventricles that we call the cephalons. Right, and then also form our epidermis as well. So we have these three main layers of embryonic tissues that form that develop into the different parts of the baby. And like I said, this process is gastralization, uh, organization system development, neuralation, formation of the nervous tissue. We talked about it a little bit in 430. And like I said, you could spend a whole semester talking about it. So I'm not even gonna touch on it other than give the vocabulary here. All right. Lastly, here we see that placenta. Here is the mature placenta. 
And again, notice as we look at the anatomy of it, the blood supplies do not cross. Basically, we have these chorionic villi that were formed by the syncytiotrophoblast and contain the capillaries of the baby. And here we have the big intervillous sinuses, this big blood-filled space where we can see, again, arteries are constantly bringing fresh blood into, veins are constantly draining blood away from it, at making, maintaining this reservoir of blood where then our gas, a gas exchange, nutrient exchange, waste exchange can take place between mom and baby. Obviously it is systemic arteries that bring the blood to the placenta for the female and systemic veins that bring it away. We have, oops, didn't mean to do that. What did I just do? There we go. That's what I wanted to do. So again, forms by the third month, baby trophoblast forms that chorionic villi, functional layer, intervillous spaces, we didn't talk about all of that. And again, this is where the exchange of most of the materials take place. Uh, diffusion of oxygen, nutrients, uh, carbon dioxide uh, from the baby to mom. Some wastes are released this way, especially things like carbon, uh, carbon dioxide, things along those lines. But why not all wastes? Where do the other wastes go? Do babies just not care about wastes? Don't they go into the amniotic fluid? Yeah, amniotic fluid, which is a very, very fancy and, and technical sounding term for what? Egg white. <laughs> not a bad guess. Nope, not e uh, even worse than that. What is amniotic fluid? Why is it so important for the doctors to monitor the volume of amniotic fluid. Why is amniotic fluid so vitally important? Uh, As the nutrients. I'm sorry? As the nutrients. No, but it doesn't have nutrients. In fact, it has the opposite. It's mostly wastes. Isn't it constantly, isn't it constantly circulating through the baby's GI tract? True, that is true as well. It is cycling through there, which, but again, not serving much of a major portion there. Maybe it helps if I point out that it is mostly a water and nitrogen-based wastes. Baby pee. It's baby pee, exactly. Amniotic fluid, right? So many of the wastes are exchanged in the blood, but much of it is also being released from those fully functional kidneys those kidneys and the urinary system of the baby is fully functioning. And again, we want there to be a large amount of amniotic fluid because, well, not large, but an appropriate amount of amniotic fluid because that means that the baby's kidneys are working properly. If amniotic fluid levels are low, they're gonna take a much closer look with the ultrasound at the baby's kidneys and more importantly at the bladder uh, to see if it's filling properly, if it's releasing properly to make sure that there aren't any problems that way. So yeah, so actually that amniotic fluid uh, that as you pointed out, does cycle through the baby's digestive system as it floats around in there, right? That is what's released when the water breaks and all of that, that's baby pee pee. So there you go. So again, we have that exchange of some materials that are most materials are being uh, taken place of here. Again, we've got that storage of nutrients and hormones. So we get a more consistent release to the baby for more uh, 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 regulated and stable growth. But we do get that effective barrier. Mom's blood and baby's blood do not come in contact with each other through the placenta. Of course, that placenta has to be released uh, at, during the process of uh, uh, partuition, labor, and delivery, uh, and is typically referred to as the afterbirth. Here, we actually see an actual placenta. Uh, so again, one of the things that the doctor is looking for when that placenta is delivered is to make sure it is complete and intact so that no portions are left behind. As we know, it is a very well vascularized structure. So if it is not, if it is uh, 
not intact, that could increase the likelihood of bleeding occurring in the female. The other thing, as we mentioned, is placenta is basically a major hormonal gland. So if portion of the placenta stays behind, even if it's not um, uh, causing massive bleeding, uh, the hormones produced by those cells can disrupt mom's ability to recover from the pregnancy, mom's ability to produce milk, and things along those lines. Of course, the placenta connects to the baby via the umbilical cord. Here we see an umbilical cord surrounded by its fibrous connective tissue. Inside of it are not one but two arteries and one vein. So there are actually three blood vessels uh, here in the placenta. And as we think about it, as we know, arteries, how do we define arteries again? They go away from the heart. And uh, uh, veins or the towards the heart. So in our baby, those oops, veins that are going towards the heart, what is the condition of their blood? The veins are oxygen rich. Yeah, so because they're getting the oxygen from mom, they're going to be oxygen rich. Oops. And so that means our arteries are oxygen poor. Excellent. Uh, where do these oxygen rich veins go? After, it, where are they? So they're coming back from the placenta. Where do they go? Vena cava. They are going to go to the vena cava, but they're going to make a side trip on the way. Because not only are these oxygen rich, but what else do we know about uh, the blood coming back from the placenta? It's nutrient in a Nutrient rich, and you're right. Nutrient rich doesn't necessarily mean nutrient appropriate. So where does it need to go first before we can distribute it throughout the body? There Tiny baby liver. To the liver, absolutely. And as we talked about, when that umbilical cord is cut on the outside, it shrivels up and becomes the belly button. But the portion of that umbilical cord on the inside shrivels up and becomes what? What happens to those umbilical veins after the umbilical cord is cut? They become the portal uh, system? No, nope. they also shrivel up, become non-functional. But if only I could remember the name of that round non-functional structure that attached to the liver when I looked at the mature liver. What was it called? This is a cumulative class, right? Digestion was one of the sections we covered in this. I have the picture in my head. Yeah, well, the so round, was, li round ligament. There you go, Lig ligamentum teres, the round ligament. Absolutely, that round ligament that connected to the liver, right, is what remains of those. So when you cut the umbilical cord on the outside, right, that vein carrying the blood to the liver shrivels up and becomes the ligamentum teres. The arteries actually come off of the in, uh, internal iliac to go to the uh, inform those. And so those shrivel up as well into something that we don't have to worry about. But that ligamentum teres was something we talked about for that vein. Excellent. So like I said, uh, wastes typically carried two, nutrients carried away from the placenta and oxygen making these arteries and veins more like the pulmonary ones, which makes sense. Pulmonary ones are where we get the oxygen. Uh, here are the placental ones are where we get the oxygen. So it's not surprising, it's a little bit backwards. So if mom and baby's blood is not mixing yep. in the placenta, how are they doing these blood tests now that they're, they're testing maternal blood for fetal DNA, like for the sex and whatnot? When a couple of the stem cells cross the barrier and can end up in the systemic 
um, blood flow of the mother? That would be my guess. I mean, as we talked about, obviously the placenta is a little bit leaky. We do have that concern of, for instance, the, uh, the anti-RH antibodies sneaking its way across. So my guess is that it wouldn't be surprising if something from the baby uh, switches out. Obviously, it would require a very sensitive test to be able to do that. And, I, and again, this isn't my area of expertise, but I, I, not, I, and I wasn't aware of that process, but it seems reasonable that, that you may get enough, you know, uh, not necessarily enough to cause a, uh, a, a, um, an immune reaction, but potentially enough that maybe it could be identified that way. Yeah, usually they, you know, it requires amniotic fluid for a lot of those things, but it wouldn't surprise me if there was enough leakage where you could get it from the female, I mean, from the, from the mom's blood, but no, I was not aware of that. So I'm totally guessing. All right. Excellent. All right. And like I said, after birth, it becomes the ligamentum teres. We already did that. Perfect. Excellent. All right. So that is most of the anatomy that I wanted to talk about. We still have a bit more to talk about uh, with some other structures and functions and stuff like this, but I think this is a good stopping point for our first break. Let's go ahead and take our first break now. Looks like it's a 917. Uh, so we will restart at 932 uh, and I will start the recording at that point. All right. Any questions before we take our first break? And looking at what we have left might actually be our last break. Our last break ever. We'll see how far we go. All right, excellent. Questions on that? All righty, I'll see you guys in 15 minutes. All righty. Let's keep going. So we just finished talking about uh, the function of the placenta in terms of the the exchange of blood and other materials, the direction those things move and all those things. But the other thing that, as we talked about, our placenta does is play an important role in hormone production, right? We know with females, there's a lot of hormones uh, that are being produced, uh, both uh, the trophoblast, uh, again, produces that uh, human chorionic gonadotropin, uh, starting around day eight through the first four months of development, starting with that fertilized egg and then uh, the trophoblast after that. Uh, and we know that much of the process of uh, maintenance and development of the uh, baby, uh, the embryo, uh, is caused by the corpus luteum, uh, producing those progestins, primarily progesterone, and those estrogens. However, that only uh, continues until uh, the placenta forms. Remember, as we talked about, once the, placenta, blah, 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 once the placenta forms, our embryo becomes a fetus. Uh, and it usually occurs around the third month, uh, somewhere between the nine weeks and the third month of development. And it is at this point that the placenta becomes the primary gland responsible for the hormones of pregnancy. Obviously, those progestins and estrogens are still vitally important, but there's some other really important hormones that are produced by the placenta as well. Relaxin. What does relaxin do? Oh, uh, pelvic area. Yeah, absolutely. It, it releases, it helps to uh, release the tension in the ligaments and the connective tissues of the female. Uh, this allows for the accommodation uh, and the movement of the mesenteries and the organs of the abdominal pelvic cavity to allow for the expansion of the uterus and the baby uh, so that basketball can grow inside of mom. And as uh, someone mentioned also, it loosens the fibrocartilage of the pubic symphysis, helping to increase the flexibility of the true pelvis so that that release of the expulsion of the baby can take place. Uh, as we talked about way back in 430, of course, um, that pubic symphysis, that, that pelvis is the center of our structure, center of our balance, our stability, our support. So as that relax and loosens it, a female who is pregnant, especially late term pregnancy, gets a very distinctive gait to the way that she walks as a result of that. And I did say waddle. Um, but there are other important hormones that are produced as well. 
One of them is human chorionic somatomammotropin, or what is also known as human placental lactogen. And with a name like uh, you know, lactogen or somatomammotropin, uh, what do you think the function of this hormone is? Stimulates or gets the breast ready for milk production. Right, and not so much stimulates, but even more than that, right? Really what this leads to is the maturation of the mammary glands, right? A female who has never been pregnant and all males actually have mammary glands in their breast region, right? However, if you've never been pregnant or if you're a male, which I assume means you've never been pregnant, uh, then you have never produced human chorionic somatomammotropin and those glands are in an immature state. And of course, when I say an immature state, I mean uh, that they are incapable of producing milk, right? Not capable of producing milk, absolutely. However, human chorionic somatomammotropin uh, starts to be produced. It maxes at about week 32. It leads to the maturation and the development of those glands. Not producing milk yet, but making them capable of producing milk. Uh, this often leads to a swelling of the breasts and also a, uh, a, a soreness or sensitivity to the breasts that can occur as a result of that. Uh, again, before we had more precise methods of uh, measuring pregnancy uh, for, for many women, uh, this uh, sensitivity and enlargement of the breasts were uh, an indicator that a female might actually be pregnant. Uh, as a result of that. Now, obviously we become much more sophisticated with our testing and, and things along those lines. And typically you're aware of it, especially if you're trying before that occurs. Uh, but it is that important hormone necessary to convert those glands to being able to be capable of producing milk. Of course, they don't start producing milk. Which hormones are responsible for the production of milk again? Prolactin. Prolactin, absolutely. And then also not only do we need to produce milk, but we also need to let that milk out of the glands into the sinuses to be expressed. And what hormone did that again? Oxytocin. Oxytocin, excellent. And we'll talk about uh, that uh, reflex again in just a bit. Lastly, there is another important hormone that is produced and that is corticotropin releasing hormone. Now, corticotropin-releasing hormone uh, is uh, what hormone? Uh, what, what do you think it does? Let's say it that way. Stimulates the creation or synthesis of corticoids. <laughs> yeah, and, and so where are those corticoids produced? In the adrenal gland. What part of the adrenal gland? Damn it. Come on, it's in the name. Adrenal cortex. Yeah, the cortex, it's in the name. <laughs> you were there, you, walked, you did the hard part, you missed the easy part. Absolutely, in the cortex, uh, specifically uh, those uh, glucocorticoids. Remember we talked about glucocorticoids being important for mobilizing resources during a stress response. Uh, and while you know, arguably pregnancy could be thought of as stress, but as we also talked about, there's a massive increase in metabolism of that female during pregnancy. And so being able to mobilize those resources, encouraging the breakdown of fats uh, for those resources is an important function. So being able to stimulate that is gonna be vitally important for helping to uh, increase the female's metabolism and the resources available for that, re for that increased metabolism as that baby grows inside of that. Yes, unrelated question, go ahead. So, with birth control, the idea is to administer a hormone that, I guess, somewhat simulates pregnancy, correct? Uh, essentially, yes. Although in, in particular, and like I said, if, if you think back to it, the earliest and most simplest form of birth control for a female was progestin pills. Right, they would take progesterone as a supplement because, as we know, progesterone uh, encourages uh, the maintenance of the uterine wall, so uh, so menstruation does not occur, and 
as we've also talked about, if you have a mature egg being developed, if you have a mature baby developing inside of you, the female's body doesn't want to be maturing any more eggs. You don't want to ovulate a second egg if you're already taking care of a first baby. And remember, as we talked about, uh, those progestins are those important warning signs that the egg has been fertilized, I mean, that as the egg has been released, and progesterone levels stay high if that egg has been fertilized. The human chorionic gonadotropin maintains the corpus luteum, maintains progesterone levels. And so if progesterone levels are high, progesterone inhibits uh, the maturation of more follicles. And so no more eggs are produced. So uh, the, the, I, would say, I would argue that the maintenance of the uterine wall is really more of a side effect of the birth control pills. Uh, it's much more important that we uh, inhibit or suppress the development of those follicles. Because if we can depress the development of the follicles, no eggs are ovulated. And if no eggs are ovulated, no pregnancy can occur. Yes, I was going to ask if, um, if it stimulates pregnancy, then how come it doesn't increase metabolism? Or rather, why is a side effect of birth control sometimes weight gain? But Based on your answer, it sounds like it's only one part of the entire hormonal equation that leads to increased metabolism. Right. Yeah. And and although, like like you also mentioned, if it is stimulating uh, the again, it's kind of like what we talked about with stress, right? When uh, the stress reflexes were formed, we really stress was to deal with life or death situations. Right now, stress is that 10 page paper you have due on Friday, or stress is that lab and lecture exam you have on Wednesday. And how do you deal with stress now? Well, you sit at a typewriter and you type for those 10 pages, or you stare at your textbook or your flashcards for hours on end, right? The stress, stress is mobilizing those resources in our body and we're not using them. And so the same thing could be happening with those, uh, with those birth control pills. Uh, you may be mobilizing the resources for the increased metabolism, but since no baby's uh, developing inside of you, you don't have that increased metabolism. And so all those excess resources are being released uh, and then have to be stored as fat as a result of it, right? Uh, the maturation of the mammary glands is also uh, a side effect, potential side effect of, uh, of taking birth control. So often you can see an enlargement of the breasts as a result of taking birth control pills. Um, yeah, but again, those were the earlier forms of those. And again, the, the simplest forms of those, as Allison points out, uh, we have gotten much more sophisticated in our targeting and our birth control pills are now far more uh, precise in the goal of being able to right, disrupt uh, both either the, well, quite frankly, either the uh, fertilization or the um, or the uh, maintenance of that oocyte or the implantation of it. Yep. And so, yes, so typically those types of side effects are much more, uh, less common, much less common. Excellent. All right, spectacular. Oh, we got sidetracked and, and again, and I love the question, so don't get me wrong that way, but I, what I wanted to say, the other important thing about corticotropin releasing hormone is uh, that the levels of that will actually start to increase near the end and can actually play an important role in the triggering of partuition, of the triggering of labor. So corticotropin releasing hormones will actually play an important part in that. And that's actually what I wanted to talk about now. It's actually uh, a lot of this labor is driven by hormone changes. So uh, let's actually, we'll do it here and then we'll go back to the picture. Let's do it this way just in case because I may have the picture here, I don't remember. So uh, notice, actually, let's go back just to make sure. As we know, progesterone levels, as we talked about how are so vitally important early on during the pregnancy, maintaining of the uterus, uh, maintaining of all of those things. But notice as we get later in the process, progesterone levels start to not decline, but become less than estrogen levels. Estrogen levels actually start to spike. And this combination of the spiking of estrogen levels and this tapering off of progester progesterone levels are one of the major triggers uh, for parturition to take place. So again, uh, we have uh, that rise in estrogen levels. 
as I just finished mentioning, corticotropin releasing hormone levels also rise. And our progesterone levels taper off. These changes in our hormone levels lead to a contraction of the uterine wall. And assuming that the baby is fairly uh, baked, it should be face down, head down uh, towards the cervix. And so as that contraction begins, baby's head is pushed against the uh, wall of the cervix. Placenta also produces prostaglandins, which remember were also found in the semen and cause uterine contractions. It's one of the reasons why we talked about you have to be very careful about having uh, intercourse close to in, in late stage pregnancy because the prostaglandins of the semen can trigger these uterine contractions. And as the uterus contracts, that triggers a stretch, right? The, the force of the baby's head against the cervix uh, causes a stretch. And that stretch sends a signal to the hypothalamus. And that hypothalamus causes the posterior pituitary to release oxytocin. Oxytocin, of course, causes uterine contractions, making the placenta, pardon me, making the uterus contract even more, causing it to stretch even more, causing a bigger signal being sent to the hypothalamus. And as we talked about, this triggers that positive feedback process. And that positive feedback process is going to cause an enhancement of that disturbance, an enhancement of the amount of oxytocin, an enhancement in the strength of the contractions, right? Again, normally we need to think of feedback processes as canceling a disturbance to bring it back into balance. But in this case, we're enhancing the disturbances. The disturbances are getting bigger. But remember our goal is still the same. Our goal is to reestablish homeostasis. So our contractions become more and more powerful, more and more oxytocin is released, right? More and more uh, strength is being put into it until baby is expulsed, right? At which point mom's body is back in homeostasis. Life is no longer in homeostasis, but mom's body is back in homeostasis. And that is that goal of the positive feedback process. So we do want to reestablish that homeostasis, uh, but we do it in this case by enhancing those processes with that positive feedback. Now there's a little bit more to labor than that. It isn't just about the contractions and the pushing. There's actually three phases or stages to parturition or, uh, well, again, Mom's body's back in homeostasis, but like I said, life is not, absolutely. The first is dilation. Oh, I don't have a ruler here handy. Usually this is when I grab the yardstick. As we talked about, that cervix has a very uh, narrow opening with that mucus plug to limit uh, the, the uh, movement of any foreign abnormal pathogens, things like that into the open. Uh, uh, abdominal pelvic cavity of that open reproductive tract. But that cervix uh, starts to both efface, which becomes more loose, more flexible, but also dilates as well to allow that basketball to pass through it. And what is the massive diameter of this cervix when it is ready to release the baby out? Two feet, two and a half feet. What is the diameter of that cervix? 10 centimeters. 10 feet? 10 centimeters, right? 10 centimeters. centimeters. Right, right, tiny little opening. Absolutely, so pass the basketball through that. Sounds like a tremendous amount of fun, right? Uh, again, as we talked about that, <laughs> just exactly, you get that nice cone shape. Um, but they're pretty flexible at that age as well, absolutely. So as we talked about with that positive feedback process, 
we get uh, increase in the strengths of the contractions. Notice as we mentioned, a uh, baby is typically face down and head down uh, to be able to pass through that. And so you get that effacing and that dilation of the cervix, this and that this increase in the contractile strengths. This process can take from, uh, you know, two hours to two days for this process to occur. Right, so, so for some individuals, this can occur relatively rapidly, uh, but in others, it can be a very slow, steady process with lots of stalls along the way. Typically during this dilation, we get a rupturing of that amniotic sac, allowing the amniotic fluid to be released. However, if dilation has stalled, one of the things they will do is actually with a little hook, they will go in and they will rupture that amniotic sac to allow the amniotic fluid to escape. That rupturing of the amniotic fluid can often uh, enhance the dilation and contraction process, increasing the likelihood of uh, labor continuing. But once that amniotic fluid ruptures and releases, basically baby in the internal environment is now exposed to the outside world. So at this point, the clock is ticking. If baby doesn't come out on its own, this is not the kind of thing that we can allow it to drag on for days again in this case. So typically once that amniotic fluid is either ruptures on its own or is ruptured, you're stuck in the hospital until that baby comes out one way or another. Now, hopefully, uh, with, uh, again, the effacing and dilation of the uh, cervix. Now expulsion can take place. Again, powerful contractions. Uh, the female can help with contracting the abdominal pelvic muscles, the abdominal girdle to help in this process. Uh, and expulsion takes place. They said baby typically is released head first, uh, face down through the cervix and through the vaginal canal in a process that on average takes five to 10 minutes and is completely painless, right? So again, it is a very simple, easy process that anybody can go through without any problems at all. All right, questions on that? No, this is a process, <laughs> exactly. This is a process that, take, that can be painful, can be strenuous, can be uh, challenging. It typically occurs in less than two hours. It was very traumatic for me. My wife had all the drugs. I was the one who had to actually watch it. So it was very traumatic for me. Actually, uh, my favorite birthing story, uh, my, uh, uh, our first big uh, got stuck. Uh, and so after uh, like six hours of trying to get her to expulse, they finally had to do the cesarean. And uh, I will never forget, I had the, the doctor and the two nurses were there. I was standing there in the surgical suite when this was going on. And Big had gotten herself so wedged in there that I just, I, I remember, I'm, I'm looking over the, uh, uh, over, the, uh, over the drape at the doctor and the doctor's reaching in and is like trying to pull her out and then tried the other hand and tried to pull her out. One of the nurses went in and tried to pull her out. Finally, I had to send one of the nurses under the table to push her head back in. So they were able to actually bring her out during the cesarean. So like I said, very traumatic for me. My wife was on all the drugs. She didn't feel anything at all. <laughs> No, but uh, obviously it is, uh, it is a ex very exerting process. Uh, well, what's the fun in that? I'm an anatomy and physiology teacher. Of course, I was going to watch. But um, again, the expulsion is the dramatic event, the one that when the baby finally comes out and is healthy and screams, everybody's happy. Uh, and again, you know, the cheers go up and all of that. But the process is not actually done at that stage. There is still the placental stage where the placenta has to be expulsed. As I, <laughs> wow, that's kind of cool. Well, I mean, the, that it came out chill, not the, that it's cried for four months straight after that, that's not cool. But uh, yeah, children, children are horrible, horrible things. For those of you who don't have it, I, I strongly recommend not because they're horrible. <laughs> um, but the process isn't done. We also have the, the delivery of the placenta. As I mentioned, the placenta is going to be inspected thoroughly by the doctors. Again, everybody's paying attention to the baby. Everybody's paying attention to mom. No one's really paying attention to what's going on beneath the table, uh, but there is still the expulsion. The uterine contractions continue. The placenta releases from the wall as an expulsed and again, needs to be thoroughly inspected. 
Uh, if there's any concerns about some of the placenta remaining behind, they will actually go in and scrape the uterine wall to ensure that none of that glandular tissue remains. Because as we mentioned, uh, bleeding out is a major concern if the, if the placenta ruptures or tears. But if some of the glandular cells stay behind, it can really disrupt uh, 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 milk production and, some, and, and the recovery for mom, which can be a major issue as well. What happens to the placenta when it comes out of that depends dramatically on your culture, uh, your religion, other things along those lines. Some people, uh, many people, uh, just ignore it and it gets thrown away as medical waste. Uh, others, yep, there are some people who will uh, eat it. Uh, Basque individuals, uh, for instance, is a, is a culture where that is a common practice uh, where that will occur. Uh, some people will take it and plant it with a tree, absolutely. So you have a tree that is the same age as your child and they get to grow up together. All right, you're making that up with a necklace. I've never heard that one before. Are you serious? It's yeah. true, they make little pill out of it. <laughs> So how do they process it to make a necklace out of it? They like, I don't even know, like a charm, like more like a charm. Oh, the cord so, too, Allison says. <laughs> yeah, so, oh, interesting. I had never heard that one. So is it, is it like, like when people are like cremated and then they, you know, turn it into a gem or something along those lines? Or is it, or you just have like a tube with a little bit of the stuff in it, that's... Absolutely. They like dry it out and grind it up. And that's how you can take it in capsule form also. Oh, okay. But like that ground up stuff, they can like solidify it with, I don't know, epoxy or something. And they make, they make shit out of it. How interesting. That's really interesting. All right. I guess that doesn't surprise me. Like I said, I know you can make diamonds out of, uh, out of, uh, out of, you know, people's cremated remains or not diamonds. I don't know if it's diamonds, but gems out of that. I've heard about uh, the people with dogs that are doing that came some kind of resin thing with their dogs with the paw print and stuff like that. And so, yeah, I guess I'm not surprised by that either. Um, umbilical cord is a great example also because the other thing that can happen with the umbilical cord is remember the umbilical cord still contains some of the umbilical blood. Uh, which will have some of those omnipotent stem cells. So they're individuals who will actually uh, donate it uh, to science. So much of the medical research that is done is not done on dead babies, but actually done on the uh, umbilical cord blood. Uh, you can actually pay to have it frozen. So that 20 years from now, when we know how to grow livers, uh, that if your kid, you know, becomes an alcoholic and destroys their liver, you have that umb umbilical blood to be able, the umbilical cord blood to be able to grow them a new lever, liver and implant it in there. And obviously because it's made out of their uh, stem cells, there is 0% chance of any kind of rejection from that taking place. So yes, all sorts of things can be done with the placenta and the cord blood uh, after uh, delivery takes place. All right, questions on that? All right, that is labor, which leads us to our last bit of anatomy and physiology. We've already talked about this a little bit, but let's talk a little bit more about the mammary glands. Again, we can't talk about the female reproductive system without talking about the breasts. Uh, we've already talked about this a little bit. As we know, males and females uh, that have never been pregnant both have breasts. Uh, and that breast is primarily made up of adipose tissue and immature mammary glands. However, with that human chorionic somatomammotropin, those immature glands, mammary glands, mature to become the mature lobular glands that you see here. And of course, their function is to produce the fluid that is going to feed and maintain that baby anywhere from zero to, uh, you know, uh, two years of age, right? Again, uh, some women are not able to produce milk and that is perfectly acceptable. There are plenty of uh, uh, valid and healthy uh, breast milk alternatives. Uh, some uh, are able to go six months, a year, two years. Uh, there are some individuals that will continue to breastfeed up to five, six, seven, nine years of age. Now, obviously, if you are breastfeeding a six-year-old, uh, you are typically not, it's not their primary form of um, nourishment, 
but it is often used uh, for as a bedtime behavior, as a, you know, as part of the calming behavior, a bonding uh, with the mom type of activity. So again, there's all sorts of variations. And uh, as we were talking about before, you can also sell and donate uh, your breast milk as well. All right, so we talked about that. Uh, and as we talked about, breast milk production is caused by what hormone again? Prolactin. Excellent. Prolactin is that hormone that stimulates the breast milk production. Absolutely. All right. Uh, again, here we look at the anatomy of the breast uh, surrounding the mammary glands. We have that pectoral pec. Uh, per I try that again. Pectoral fat pad, uh, the adipose that primarily forms the shape and structure of the breast. Obviously, the nipple is where the uh, openings uh, for the sinuses are located for the expression of the milk. Uh, we need, again, baby's uh, sight is not that great. So having an obvious target uh, is important for helping it to be able to identify the location. So uh, not only do the nipples have an areola around it, but typically during the pregnancy process, those areola uh, increase in pigmentation, increasing the contrast, making it easier for the baby to be able to identify it. The adipose and mammary glands are held in place by fibrous suspensory ligaments that help to attach and anchor the breast tissue in place. Again, uh, we are on our last day, so I don't want to get too much into a heated debate as to the, the, the importance of a bra, but there are some that feel uh, that a bra, uh, by taking uh, the tension off of these suspensory ligaments uh, lessens the support of the breast, causing them to descend more rapidly, where others feel not wearing a breast puts too much stress on the suspensory ligaments, uh, causing them to sag too, um, too uh, early. So again, if your goal is to maintain perky breasts, uh, there are arguments on both sides of that as to what whether it's beneficial to wear a uh, breast, I mean, to wear a breast, to wear a, uh, a bra or not wear a bra. Uh, again, uh, all I can say about that debate is I don't wear one and mine are pretty saggy. So uh, again, take that for what it is. All right. The glands themselves are a very interesting combination of tubular alveolar glands. If you remember correctly, way back in 430, we talked about how these mammary glands are a modified sudoriferous gland. And because I'm sure all of you remember your 430 stuff so well, that means that structurally, they are primarily a simple coiled tubular gland. Uh, and functionally, uh, they are, I uh, use the merocrine mode of secretion. Uh, where um, they just release their secretion via exocytosis. However, uh, these uh, glands are something that are still very closely being examined and identified, and there appears to be some potential of some alveolar uh, type of, uh, there may be some um, alveolar uh, components uh, to this. And remember also, if you think way back into 430, there also may be some glands here that use the epocrine mode of secretion. Remember the epocrine mode of secretion is where the apical part of the cell pinches off and releases, producing a thicker, more viscous, more organic type of secretion. Right. We talked about how we have sweat glands that are called epocrine glands because they produce a more organic sweat. And it was believed they use the epocrine mode of secretion. And um, so we named that. And then later they found out that was not the case. Uh, so they've been more reluctant to say that about the mammary glands. However, uh, one of the important things that, again, any woman who has breastfed before is usually aware of is that it is important to have the baby um, 
um, expulse all of the milk from a breast before you switch them to the other side. Because there's basically kind of two types of milk that are produced by the mammary glands. There is what they call the four milk. The four milk tends to be more watery, uh, tends to be more glycogen rich and therefore is easier to be expressed. So it's very easy for the baby to get out. Then there's the hind milk, uh, which has more of the lipids and more of the proteins, a little bit more viscous. And so those two different components to the milk are something that uh, may be caused by different alveolar components using a different type of secretion. The reason I mentioned why it's important to express that is that hind milk may be a little harder for the baby to get out. So sometimes it will get frustrated. And so when the baby gets frustrated, mom may incorrectly think that the breast has been emptied and go ahead and switch it over. And if the baby fills up on that form milk, which is much more watery and has much more sugar in it, all right, what happens to you when you have a big carbohydrate rich meal? Nobody here apparently eats carbs. You're not full as long. Yeah, exactly. You're not full for nearly as long. So if the baby is whining and hungry again an hour, an hour and a half later, they might not have gotten enough of that protein rich, lipid rich hind milk, which can sate them for a longer period of time. All right. So typically you want to get them to fully, uh, to, uh, to fully uh, empty one breast before you switch them over to the other. Uh, then even if they do that halfway, then you then the next time start them on the second breast and switch back and forth in that fashion in hopes of being able to drain it. Uh, because not only is that better for the baby, it's getting that um, more protein rich, more lipid rich hind milk, but it also helps with milk production to maintain that milk production for a longer period of time as well. One of the awesome things about this process, and we'll talk about the reflex in just a minute, is it is also kind of a positive feedback type of process in that uh, the more demand, the more milk the mom is able to produce. So again, if you have one baby, you're able to feed it. If you have two babies, or even in some cases, three babies, it often mom is able to produce enough milk to be able to do that. It's milk on demand. So that's how you can have women who are able to breastfeed for you know five, six years. Uh, you can have women that are able to produce enough breast milk to be able to feed multiple babies instead of just one baby, because it's very, uh, it can't, and again, I'm, probably, I, I'm, I'm painting with big broad strokes here about what it typically is. You know, I, this is one of those areas where uh, women can be highly sensitive. Not everybody's breastfeeding experiences have necessarily been positive. And again, it is perfectly acceptable to have problems and to have challenges and things along those lines. So I'm not by any means trying to say that the normal is that you should be able to breastfeed for nine years. That is not the case at all. There's all sorts of variations and experiences. Uh, it's about one of those things that you have to be open and honest with your lactation specialist about to be able to help you if you're having those challenges because many women have challenges with this and it is something that is perfectly perfectly normal so i'm just talking to the same way we talk about averages same time you know when we're talking about volumes of the tidal volume of respiration right that's just a random number not a random number but it's just an average but it, it, it encompasses so much more all the things i'm talking about here encompass so much more as well so there is no just one way one normal to the way these things work so i just want to make sure we talk about that all right. Uh, the other thing that those uh, the suspensory ligaments do is help to uh, divide the mammary glands into individual lobes made up of individual lobules. Notice also, as we talked about, it is the prolactin that causes the lobules to produce the milk. But as we also talked about, it is oxytocin that causes the milk to be released from those into the sinuses. These sinuses are these large spaces close to the nipple that allows the milk to be easily expressed with that sucking sensation of the baby. So we've got those lactiferous uh, ducts that lead into the lactiferous sinuses. And it is the sinuses that allow it to be expressed. That human chorionic somatomammotropin matures those glands in a female that is pregnant for the first time. And they're capable of producing milk, typically around uh, month six of the gestation period. But again, it is those hormones, oops, 
prolactin and oxytocin uh, that are responsible for uh, the production and release of the milk. Upon birth, uh, mom's uh, breasts typically, or mammary glands, are typically not capable of producing milk right away. Instead, they produce a very special uh, secretion called colostrum, or what they lovingly refer to as that liquid gold. This is a very protein-rich, very low-fat, small-volume substance uh, that is produced, uh, very uh, useful for the baby uh, during those early few days right after uh, parturition has taken place. Again, they're still pretty tired from the move and so aren't particularly hungry at that point of time. But typically, after the first few days, uh, those glands convert to milk production. And like I said, it is very, very dependent on use. Here is the pretty picture. And I think we've talked about this process numerous times, but I like the illustration. So we'll go ahead and go through it one more time to make sure we understand. It starts with the stimulation of the nipple. The suckling of the baby on the nipple stimulates stretch receptors. Those stretch receptors, as we've talked about, send a signal to the hypothalamus and the hypothalamus triggers the posterior pituitary to release oxytocin. Notice this is very similar to what we saw in delivery. Stretch of the uh, cervix, signal to stretch receptor, sent a signal to the hypothalamus, told the hypothalamus to release oxytocin. And in fact, that is a huge side benefit of um, breastfeeding. As I mentioned, there are women who have trouble or difficulty or it's impossible for them to breastfeed and that is perfectly acceptable and perfectly okay. However, if breastfeeding can occur, there are some advantages to that. Uh, there's advantages to the baby because of all the special stuff that they're getting in that milk, the biological stuff they're getting in that milk, including mom's antibodies, that passive immunity, that's typically not something that they get from formula. So while a formula can provide many of the nutrients, those secondary uh, 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 advantages are something that the baby can't necessarily get. There's obviously the bonding issue between uh, mom and baby from that skin to skin contact uh, that also causes the release of oxytocin, as we mentioned, is that cuddle hormone. And as we also talked about, oxytocin causes contractions of the uterus that uterus had to expand to be able to accommodate the basketball. And remember it started the size and shape of a pear. So we need to, the oxytocin release can help in the contractions of the uterus to help to get it close. It's never gonna get back down to its original size, but we can get it close to its original size. And so that oxytocin release can help with that as well. But like I said, if you're not able to breastfeed, skin to skin contact also causes oxytocin to be released, that intimacy, it's that cuddle hormone we talked about. And so that also can help in mom's recovery if she's not able to breastfeed. But that oxytocin causes the milk to be let down, right? Prolactin causes the milk to be produced, but it's the oxytocin that releases it down that to that lactiferous sinus so that it can be released. And we also talked about operant learning. Typically baby cries when they're hungry. So women start to associate a baby crying with the letdown of milk. Uh, women are able to uh, use that to our advantage when they have to go back to work and they're still breastfeeding. Uh, they often can listen to a recording of their baby or watch a video of the baby on their phone uh, to be able to hear that cry and see that baby and that can help to stimulate the milk release. But as we also talked about in this class, right, you finally get the grandparents to watch the baby after three months and you finally get your first night out on the town and you're walking into the restaurant. And as you walk into the restaurant, somebody in there with a baby has a baby that cries. And when that baby cries, what happens to you? Yeah, suddenly the front of your shirt is all soaked as a result of that. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, good old operant learning Pavlov taught us uh, is present as well. All right. Questions on that? All right, well, in that case. I don't know if you want to do it now or during review, um, looking at the histology, 
of breast tissue, I have no clue what is what. It's hard to tell in the slides. Sure, we can totally do that. Absolutely. Right. So let's let's save that for the review. Histology is good for the review. Anything else on the lecture? Can you just quickly go over the positive feedback process um, for um, parturition? I know you went over it. I just couldn't write that fast. No problem. Uh, so it, it, in some ways, we can use this picture for this as well, because basically, if you think about if we cheat, All right, and instead, oops, there's the uterus. Oops, hold on. Gotta have the baby pointed down. There we go. Excellent. So as we talked about, what happens is uh, prostaglandins being released by the placenta, the human chorionic gonadotrope, uh, human uh, chorionic, uh, pardon me, corticotropin releasing hormone, high estrogen levels, all of those things cause uh, a mild contraction of the uterus. And as the uterus contracts, it pushes the head against the wall of the cervix, where there are stretch receptors. These stretch receptors in the cervix carry a signal to the hypothalamus, triggering the posterior pituitary to release oxytocin. And that oxytocin triggers the uterus, the, the myometrium, again, if we wanna be specific, to contract. When the myometrium contracts, that pushes baby even harder against the cervix, producing an even larger stretch, producing the release of even more oxytocin, causing a more powerful contraction, pushing even harder, sending an even bigger signal, causing even more oxytocin to be released. And this in continues and the contractions become more and more and more powerful. And with the dilation of the cervix, finally the, the contractions become powerful enough where the baby is expulsed. Once the baby is expulsed, there's no more stretch of the cervix. Once the baby's out, the cervix stops being stretched. With no more stretch, there's no more signal to the hypothalamus no more oxytocin is being released and the process stops. But it doesn't stop till homeostasis is reestablished in the body, baby is expulsed. Thank you. Yep, great questions. Any others? Then, as the French say, fini. All righty, that is everything we need to talk about from a lecture standpoint. However, as I mentioned, I'm still happy to answer questions and I love the question about the histology. So let's start with that one first. However, uh, I'm not sure if I have good pictures of it. So let me see if I can find some good pictures. This is a good place to take our um, last break. So let's go ahead and take a 15 minute break. Uh, come back, actually we'll just make it a 10 minute break. So we'll take a 10 minute break, come back at 1030 and at 1030, I will answer any questions you guys have on lab, lecture, or final exams. That'll give me a few minutes to find some good slides for the memory glands, and uh, we will go from there. All right, and any other questions you guys have? Is Are the memory glands on the histology list? I assume since somebody asked that they were there, I have, I, 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 sometimes I put them on there, sometimes I don't, so I don't remember. 
I don't I'll be honest, my printer died and I haven't printed it. So I don't know. I was just looking through the CRC stuff and it was there. Okay. Well, we can, so let's look at it there anyway. It, again, it's not a bad thing to look at and it won't take long. It's pretty easy to actually uh, tell the difference. In many ways, it is kind of similar to this. So the short answer to your question is it's kind of similar to the uterus. Uh, when the uterus is in its pre-ovulatory stage, there are glands in it, but they're relatively small. After ovulation, those glands become massive and huge. And it's pretty much the same way with the mammary tissue. Uh, in the mammary tissue, the, you see these tiny little branches uh, that then when it becomes mature, becomes uh, large and massive. So we will take a quick look at that. It doesn't hurt whether it's on there or not. It's something we've talked about. So it's worth looking at, even if it isn't gonna be emphasized on the exam. So let's come back at 1030 and we will do that. All right, I'll see you guys in 10 minutes. All righty. So I saw the debate in the chat before as to whether or not this is going to necessarily be on the exam and, and whether or not the histology there, it's, it's still a, a valid question and one that doesn't hurt. And it's got a very easy answer to it. I looked at that, um, I looked at the, uh, the CRC site. And, and again, it's not bad pictures, but I actually find this one to be one of those that are more useful uh, when you look at it at a lower magnification. So here's that Yale site, which uh, again, I'm very, very impressed by. And notice here, when we look at an inactive and immature, and again, the term inactive is a little probably inaccurate here. Uh, this is really an immature uh, breast. We can see some ducts uh, but we're not seeing a lot of glandular tissue itself. So most of what we're seeing here is just fibrous connective tissues, adipose, uh, things along those lines. However, when it becomes mature and is active, you see massive branching of these glands. So the glands become much more elaborate, much more branching in a mature gland. And we can tell this one is active because notice that glandular tissue is filling with all of these sinuses, all these spaces that are going to contain the milk that is being produced and will be let out out of the large duct, the lactiferous ducts, into the lactiferous sinus. So not only can we see elaborate glandularization of this tissue, much more of the secretory structures, but if you think about it, this almost looks a little bit like the thymus. Remember, the thymus had those big, huge, colloid-filled uh, spaces. The difference between this and the thymus is those are all circular follicles, whereas here we have spiral tubular structures. So we see more irregularity in the shapes of the secretary structures, but we can see they're filled uh, with that secretion because they're actively producing. So like I said, whether or not it's something that's emphasized on the histology, I think it is very, very easy to distinguish between an immature and a mature uh, mammary gland just because of the difference of the size, the difference of the glandularization. And when it's active, it's even more large and more elaborate. All right. So again, I think it's still a valid question whether or not it's emphasized on the histology handout that you guys have. It is useful that way. All right. So as always, the review is your opportunity to ask me questions on anything. Again, uh, this is an opportunity, our last opportunity to talk and meet before uh, the last lab and lecture exam, but also uh, if everything goes well, this may be the last time I see you, well, really ever, which also brings me to the last thing I want to say. I know half of the people have left already, but for those of you who are, are left, I want to uh, thank you for many of you. Uh, it has not just been a, uh, an, an insane semester together, but an insane year together as well. The past two semesters that we've been online have been a truly uh, unique and surreal situation. Uh, again, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that years from now, we will all look back and laugh at how this is as life goes back to normal, as it hopefully appears that, that it is doing. But um, it has been uh, a, a challenge, both I know for your standpoint, but also from my standpoint as well to do this. This is a class that is very hands-on. 
and uh, some of us have spent the past year together and never actually met in person. And so it is a very surreal situation. Uh, I uh, wish you all tremendous success moving forward in your academic careers. I hope you're able to get on and do the things that you uh, want to do and are successful. Uh, and hopefully, uh, again, I know you won't think that way now and especially over the next week or so, but uh, hopefully like many of the students I hear back from, you will think back fondly on this time and that uh, uh, hopefully I've been able to provide you with some information that will help you to be successful as you move on in your careers. So again, enjoy your summer. Great success for you as you guys move on from that. But uh, with that, uh, I open the floor to you guys for questions. I want you to be successful on this last exam. I want you to be successful on the final. Some of you took my final from 430, so you know what to expect, but also some of you have not. So for those of you who haven't, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Uh, students who had me in 430 can tell you about their experience with the final to see what they thought of it. Uh, so I'm open to, to open the floor at this point to anybody who has anything that they would like to, to ask. How can I help you to be successful on this exam? Professor, I just want to, I just want to thank you for, um, for your time and everything. Cause I know a lot of other online classes, a lot of the teachers just throw assignments and everything at you and just tell you to read the book. But I do appreciate your uh, effort that you've put into the class and actually spending, you know, uh, Mondays and Wednesdays with us to actually teach us and help guide us. Well, thank you. That, that, that means a lot to me. Like I said, this has been, uh, I, again, I'm, I'm hesitant to use the word fun. <laughs> I'm not sure this has been a fun experience. I don't think any of us wanted this, but I, I, I at least tried to uh, um, make it hopefully as, as conducive as a learning experience and as interactive as a learning experience as possible. So yeah, so you're not just looking at pre-recorded things. And again, I'm not taking away from people who had to do that. I understand other situations and, and, and all of you are dealing with similar situations. Uh, being stuck at home, surrounded by your family, surrounded by your kids and things along those lines I, and other responsibilities, family responsibilities. Uh, under the best of circumstances, taking a class like this is challenging and these are definitely not been the best of circumstances. So uh, uh, we have uh, survived together, gotten our battle scars. And like I said, hopefully uh, we will look back uh, fondly and laugh about this one day. But like I said, let me, be help, let me help you be successful in the exam. What can I tell you? Uh, I can't tell you what's on the exam because again, it's going to be, uh, we'll go over everything again from the beginning. Excellent. Sure. In 15 minutes, cover the entire class in 15 minutes. Um, but uh, absolutely, uh, again, I, I think you guys, crash course. Yeah, see, that is the challenge. And, uh, so, okay, here, here are the things that I will tell you about the final. And again, those of you who took me for 430 and took the cumulative final, uh, hopefully you can uh, react to this. The one thing that I would say, the one thing that is different about this final exam from 430 is in 430, all of the information kind of builds on its stuff. We learn about cells, we learn about tissues, and we put those tissues together to make organs. And so all of that information kind of built on itself. Uh, so all of the sections kind of lended to each other. Even when we learned about the muscle system, it taught us a little bit about action potentials, which we nerved on the nervous system. Whereas 431, there isn't really been that same kind of through theme. If you really think about it, this has really been five completely distinct units. Cardiovascular system, right? Uh, lymphatic and endocrine, uh, digestive, urinary and respiratory and reproductive. Now, obviously many of these systems work with each other, especially being like respiratory and cardiovascular, but also the, many of them were very separate as well. I guess there were some through themes in that we still talked about the nervous system and how it controls it all and the endocrine system, how hormones control this all. But for this test, it really is five kind of separate compartments that are gonna be divided up into five different units. And again, with a hundred multiple choice questions, that means about 20 questions per section, all right? So uh, for the final exam, you really do wanna kind of spread yourself out over the material. Uh, I like to think that 50% of the material on this is stuff that we've used so many times in this class that it should just be aha information. When you look at it, you just automatically know that, right? Arteries carry blood away from the heart. 
that's a concept that we've talked about many, many times in this class. So that should be some, you know, an aha piece of information uh, that we don't know. We know, <clears throat> you know, oxygen and carbon dioxide come together to form uh, carbonic acid, right? That's something we've used in many sections, aha information. Uh, so half of the information should hopefully be that way. And yes, absolutely. Uh, the practice chapter tests, the uh, study guides and things like that, especially since it's multiple choice questions, the more multiple choice questions you take, the better off you're going to be. Uh, the one thing I will warn you is, and again, it's a little different when in the classroom, I give you back the tests and you get to keep them forever. Um, but one of the things that I warn students is that this exam isn't made up of all of the multiple choice questions you've had in the past. Is it possible that one or two of them might show up that way? Possibly, but it's also quite possible that you could have 100 questions you've never seen before. Again, the point is not to test you on what you've already been tested on, but to make sure you understand all the concepts in this class. Every single test we've taken hasn't covered all of the information in that section. So it's quite possible you could see questions on stuff you haven't been tested on before, but still should be important concepts that we talked about in this class. Yes, so uh, for the most part, multiple choice questions are going to be the same types of questions that you've had before. The two differences that I would say are the first, is the two different types of multiple choice questions. And again, these aren't new types of questions that you guys haven't had before, but uh, one of those will be process questions. Normally, if I had a process, you would have an essay question where you have to describe the steps in a process. But what you might have instead as a multiple choice questions is you might have the five steps of the process listed out and then the multiple choice questions are to put them in order. Is it two, four, five, three, one? Whoops, that's not a one. Or is it a five, three, four, two, one? Or is it one, three, you know, that kind of thing where you have to pick the correct order for the questions. So that may be a type of question that we haven't really seen on previous exams because if there was something that had steps in the process, I'm making you write those out on the exam. Obviously this is all multiple choice, so you can't do that. The other is while the, there is no anatomy final exam, uh, there could be some um, anatomy type pictures. Uh, my guess is it would easily be less than 10% of the questions. So my guess is probably somewhere to five to eight questions or something like that. But again, it is somewhat random. But one of the questions is you may see a picture of a heart that has a bunch of labels on it. And it may ask you to identify uh, the structure uh, with label one. And you, of course, would look at that and see that that is indeed the left ventricle. And that would be awesome. I know it's not the left ventricle, I made that up. Uh, it's uh, the, the right atrium, but you get the idea. So it might, there might be those kind of questions as well. Again, it's not gonna be a, a large component. There may be a few in there. I wouldn't spend too, too much time on your anatomy and it should be, you know, uh, basic stuff. The, the example that um, I used in 430, I can't think of a good example off the top of my head, but uh, for instance, in 430, um, you learn the origins and the insertions of all the muscles. On the final exam, I wouldn't make you remember that the short head of the bicep brachia connects to the coracoid process of the scapula. But you should know that the bicep brachia sits on top of the, you know, the, the uh, humerus bone. So you, know, you might need to know the bone that a muscle is related to, but not necessarily its bone feature, right? So kind of a little level up from the depth that we normally go through on something like that. And also remember, the other important thing to remember about multiple choice questions is that you are not pulling the information out of the ether. When you have a multiple choice question, the correct answer is given to you. Your job isn't to come up with the correct answer. Your job is to recognize the correct answer. But I will remind you that there are two problems with that. The first problem with that is that there's no partial credit. You either get it right or you get it wrong, All right? With an essay question, as long as you have some of the information, you're getting some of the points. That is not the case with a multiple choice question. It's all or nothing. And by definition, multiple choice questions are a little tricky. 
you misread one word or misinterpret one of the words in it, they're going to have that trap answer there to catch you. So as I always say in this class, but this is especially true on the final, read the questions carefully. People often lose points, not because they don't know the information, but because they don't read the questions carefully. Read the questions carefully so you can answer them correctly. Ash, you had a question? Yeah, I was going to ask because of um, finals, if the open lab hours were going to be the same, different, reduced, or? Uh, my understanding from the past is that Jeff will should have his normal office hours this week like he normally would. So I, I mean the normal open lab like he normally would. So my understanding is that it shouldn't change. And I have not received an email from him uh, that said otherwise. I guess I can double check today because we've been in class. But over the weekend or last week, I didn't get anything like that. So it is my understanding Yeah, I haven't heard from him otherwise. Uh, so it's my understanding that the uh, uh, open lab will be the normal hours this weekend. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, any other questions on the final or uh, like I said, the upcoming lab and lecture thing? Um, I've been trying to figure out sample essay questions um, between the, the hormone levels, the uterine cycle, the ovarian cycles. And I mean, a lot of that information is all kind of inner woven, but do you have any kind of examples so I can try to... So, uh, so you, you, you have, you're correct. With the females, one of the problems with these is that the information is much more interwoven with itself. So what I would try to do is uh, the same way we kind of covered it in class, where while it all over relates with each other, we also tried to talk about every single one of them individually. So we talked about obviously we talked about mitosis and meiosis, but we also talked about oogenesis, right? So that would be a specific process. And that's just what's going on in the egg. Um, obviously related to that, but a separate process and therefore a separate essay question would be the ovarian cycle. Well, obviously the egg changes during the ovarian cycle. The ovarian cycle was much more about what was happening to the follicle cells right, their transformation from follicular cells to granulosa cells to that tertiary follicle to the corpus luteum to the corpus albicans and everything that went along with that, all right? Um, that process we know was regulated by the hormones, controlled by the hormones. So we talked about how we initiate the hormone cycle in the females, but we also talked about how follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone drive these processes and drive the production, not just of the follicle, but also the hormones as well. So if we don't focus as much on the follicle or as much on the egg, but instead talk about the hormones that are being controlling and being produced, right? We can talk about hormonal control of that. So that would be an essay question. And then obviously those hormones that are produced by the ovary, not only do they affect the anterior pituitary, not only do they drive the follicular process, but they also drive the uterine cycle. So then obviously the uterine cycle and the effects of estrogen and progestins on that uterine cycle would be an essay question as well. So what is that five essay questions basically from the female process, something like that. So I would try to focus on those individual components of it when you were doing those essay questions. Yes. They overlap. Yes, it's okay to mention those things, but uh, you know, if you're talking about uh, the ovarian cycle, for instance, don't get bogged down into the process of the uneven division that takes place in that primary oocyte as it becomes a secondary oocyte in the first polar body. That's not really. Yes, that's occurring at the same time, but it's not really a part of the ovarian cycle, right? We know when it becomes tertiary, a follicle. We have a secondary oocyte at that time, but I don't have to spend a paragraph talking about, you know, meiosis one in the egg uh, as part of that. So try to focus solely on what the question is asking, right? As we know, questions can have multiple points on it, but one of the things that I think students get in trouble with is they add, quest they add words to a question. 
Don't add words to a question. Just try to see precisely. Again, I try to put care and effort into the writing of these questions, lab or lecture. I try to be very careful in my wording because you don't have that opportunity to raise your hand and ask me. So I try to be very precise, very particular in my wording of the questions to try to help you to really see what I'm asking you for. So one of the things you can do is not try to interpret the question or add parts to the question, just try to focus on the words as they're given to you. So again, that's the, the best I can do with this type of a situation. And again, it's double challenging. We're not in the classroom, so um, you can't ask me questions if you're confused about a question. And the other problem is because of the randomness of it, everybody's getting a completely different test. So it's not like I write the test and I know exactly what I'm looking for and I can make sure that right it's it's an appropriate coverage of the material and all those types of things. I don't have that uh, that power here in that necessarily. So again, there's a little bit more randomness to the questions. And I know that sometimes can be confusing as well because two questions may seem very similar and that may be the case. And normally I wouldn't have two similar questions on the exam, but because of the randomness of this, uh, sometimes you may get questions that are similar. And so it is important to make sure you uh, emphasize just specifically what each question is asking about. Anything else? Um, Laura, I was going to say um, in response to your question, there's a lot of good like practice tests online outside of his course. And then also I noticed with the e-text version of the, um, the textbook that we have, there's um, learning objectives and they usually hit almost every like essay question that he yeah. asks. Again, it's one of the things I like about this class. This class is hard. I don't have to be tricky. Right. I know you guys have to put the time and effort into being successful on this. So like I said, when I can, I try to, you know, like I tell you, you know, I, I told you, for instance, that, you know, one of the transport pathways for the uh, for, you know, the the, the uh, for the proximal convoluted tubule was going to be an essay question. Uh, as Laura pointed out, I mean, uh, we spent the beginning of this class, this section, two days, I think, basically talking about mitosis, meiosis. Uh, spermatogenesis and oogenesis, right? So there's a half dozen possible questions that we could do on those types of things. And the, I guarantee one of them is gonna be on your exam. I have no idea which one, right? Maybe you'll be describing spermatogenesis. Maybe you'll be uh, comparing oogenesis and spermatogenesis. Maybe you'll comp be comparing mitosis and meiosis, right? I, again, uh, there, there's gonna be some variations there, but anything we spend a lot of time talking about in the class, which often are the things that are those con major concept points in the chapter are definitely things that are gonna be on there. Yeah. Ryan, did you have a question as well? Yeah, with the final being in multiple choice format, um, all multiple choice, will we be receiving a final score right away instead of waiting to for the final grade? Great, great question. Uh, no, uh, because while, um, it is multiple choice and right away it'll be yes or no. Uh, again, with this type of a format, I wanna make sure that the, because of the randomness of it, I wanna A, make sure that there weren't any problems with the question bank that I put in, make sure there aren't any errors that way. So I wanna check that. And I wanna make sure that uh, the questions were distributed in such a way that I'm comfortable with. Uh, uh, in some instances, not always, because uh, especially in the second semester, it, it shouldn't be necessary. But if I find that for whatever reason, the exams were a little bit more challenging than they should be, I could potentially curve it. Uh, so uh, so I'm not, so the, the grades will not be released as soon as that. However, we have a week between your uh, last lab and lecture exam and the final. So I will be doing the best I can to, and who gets first priority? Uh, sorry, it's going to be the 430 class. Their final is on the 18th. So I will be starting with their exams. I don't know if I will get your lab and lecture exams graded by then. I'm going to do my best to try to get things graded. My guess is usually within... Uh, so your exams on Wednesday, my guess would be by the following Monday uh, that I should have uh, everything graded and input. So then what I will do is I will post the grades with your participation, with any extra credit, with the replacing of your lowest lecture score with the final exam. All of that will be posted so that you can observe it and then we'll have a couple days. So if there's anybody has any concerns or questions or, or, or any issues that way, we can get those resolved and then I'll be making them official. So you, unless, unless I somehow miraculously get everything graded ahead of time, you won't get that grade right away. 
but uh, usually uh, within a day or two, I'll have it posted and you'll be able to see all of that. All right. Excellent. Great questions. Any others? I was just looking at a testee and is there a clear point where the epididymis turns into the vas deferens or is there like a, or how does that work? So uh, as you were observing your testis, one of the things you should have noticed is that again, it is, it is this enlargement on the outer surface of the testis. So basically it's this comma shaped structure uh, where it has this tightly coiled tube. And at the end of it, basically it stops being coiled and it straightens as it leaves the epididymis. So basically where it becomes straight and where it leaves that comma straight structure would be where I would say that it, it changes from the epididymis to the uh, ductus deferens. Yeah, histologically, they're different as well, but again, you're not responsible for the ductus difference histologically, so we don't have to worry about that. But yeah, so basically, it's uh, on the on the anatomy, it's where it, it leaves and straightens out. That's really the big difference between the ductus difference and the and the epididymis is the ductus difference is straight, uh, the epididymis is in direct contact with the testis and tightly coiled. Yeah. Remember in that in that small little comma shaped structure is 30 feet of tubing. So it's packed in there. All right. Any other questions? All righty. Well, then for the very last time, I wish you guys great success. Good luck on the exams. Good luck on the finals. I am here and available. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns, so again, reach out by email, come to my office hours, do all of those things. Uh, otherwise, uh, like I said, I hope to not see you because if I'm seeing you over the next week and change, it's because you're having problems on the exam and hopefully uh, that will not be the case. Uh, yes, it has indeed been a wild ride. Like I said, I hope to be able to look back and laugh at this fondly at some point. Uh, so I wish you guys great success and uh, good luck on the exams and uh, I will uh, see you uh, and best of luck on your academic careers. All right, take care guys. Bye.